Um, I looked around the room and I saw a number of people with gray hair like myself and I thought that it would be nice to remind you of one of the great poets of our time and when we knew him uh, this is what Bob Dylan looked like. For those of you staring with this quizzical look on your face, this is what Bob Dylan looks like now. He was really, use the word cool, which we used to use at the time. But the reason I show this is because he said something that is timely. And he said that if your time to you is worth saving, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are a changing. And basically, that's what we're going to talk about today. Because there is no area in our field that has changed more rapidly. And to be honest, it has changed with little impact from us. We had lots of things that were responsibilities that were given to us that really we didn't ask for. And we now have the responsibility, as was mentioned, to pass this on and counsel our patients about what to do with this. Just want to point out how much things have changed. In the last five to seven years, we now, if we wanted to, have the ability to do all of these tests on the fetus. We can and have for 50 years done a karyotype. We can do micro deletions and duplications, whole exome sequencing to identify de novo mutations in Mendelian disorders. We now can do whole genome sequencing. We can do epigenetics. We have the ability right now to do all of this and to test the fetus by CVS as early as 11 or 12 weeks. But the question is, should we be doing this? And when should we be doing this? And how should we introduce this to our practice? And there are two main questions, because none of this, or only a small part of this, can right now be done non-invasively. So the question is, what risk of a diagnostic test would our patients be willing to take in order to get all of this information about their fetus. So really, one question is, what is the risk? And I think for those of you who have been keeping up with meta-analysis, the most recent meta-analysis have shown no statistical increased risk of losing a pregnancy from either a CVS or an amniocentesis. Now, that's crazy. We know that there are some risks to the procedures we do, but what this means is the risk of losing a pregnancy by trying to get all of this information. We tell our patients it's somewhere between one in 700 and one in 1,000. It is absolutely no higher than that with one caveat, and that's it. The person doing the procedure has experience in doing the procedure. The second question is what genetic information is appropriate for our patients. Sure, we can do all this testing, and the tools, which we're going to hear about, both myself and Huda are going to talk about that, we've gone from the ability to do a karyotype, to smaller microdeletions with microarray, to now single base pairs. So we really, and that's what has moved the whole field along not our, well, basically, our, tech, our technology. We, and you will hear a lecture today, about screening for Down syndrome and 13 and 18. I just want to point out that when we talk about genetic diseases that can affect our pregnancies, or the women's pregnancies, it's not all Down syndrome. This is the incidence of potential genetic diseases that the fetus can have. Overall, the risk of something that we could test for, for NIPS or NIPT, is, I, this says .2, it's actually about one in 800 pregnancies. It's rare. We have had our paradigm 
for testing for genetic disease of the fetus, basically testing for Down syndrome for over a half a century without any change. So you talk about being resistant to change, that's a lot of resistance, but again, it was because the tools haven't caught up. But other things we could potentially diagnose, there are other chromosome abnormalities, twice as frequent as Down syndrome, microdeletions and duplications, uh, six times more frequent, autosomal recessive Mendelian disorders, um, about twice as frequent, and really, the biggest issue are structural congenital anomalies, and we know that many of them are, almost all of them now are identifiable but ultrasound, but by ultrasound. But I want to point out that many of these, probably more than two-thirds, are caused by an underlying genetic disease, which you can see illustrated here. So, again, in the United States, we spend the majority of our prenatal money screening for this, and we really have to start paying attention to the other fetal genetic disorders. So let's start by going through each of these. First of all, and you will hear much more about this from Huda, but let's talk about copy number variants. Um, basically, they are small deletions or duplications, too small to be seen by a karyotype. A prenatal karyotype can only see things that are 10 million base pairs or bigger because you have to use a light microscope and that's the limitation. Basically, copy number variants are identified by microarray. We basically cut the chromosomes into small pieces. We can then identify the presence or absence of small pieces as small as 200,000 base pairs compared to 10 million base pairs, which we would see with the karyotype. These are not uncommon. The possibility that a pregnant woman is carrying a pregnancy in which there is a microdeletion or duplication, and this has been duplicated by many studies, is about one in 90 pregnancies. Remember, trisomy 21 in the general population is one in 800, and remember, in a 20 or 25-year-old, it's one in 2,000. So these are much more frequent. Again, this is another way to look at it. In the blue line, it's the frequency of Down syndrome. In the red line, it's the frequency of pathogenic. That means a copy number variant with clinical implications does not change with age, and not until a woman's 40 are the risks of each the same. Well, that's nice. We can diagnose these, but how important are they? Well, here I've listed two separate um, separations of copy number variants. Some copy number variants, mostly deletions, cause entire syndromes that probably many of you are familiar with. The George syndrome, miller deeker which is severe lysencephaly, severe mental retardation, Smith-McGinnis, severe mental retardation, etc. You are familiar with each of these. Look at the size of the deletion and compare it to the 10 million base pairs that you could get with a karyotype. All of them are much smaller. There also are non-syndromic effects of microdeletions. That means they can cause one single problem but not a whole syndrome of findings. And I've listed some of them here, but I just want to call your attention to the size of these and some of them are 500 to 800,000 base pairs, but they can be associated with autism, uh, developmental delay, actually severe schizophrenia, et cetera. So one would not argue that many of these have a phenotype, certainly much worse than trisomy 21. As a matter of fact, it's my understanding in Europe and in the States Many women with trisomy 21 pregnancies are making a decision to continue the pregnancy because of, of their, their perception of, of what that phenotype means. This is two tables. This table is the top 10 microdeletions that a clinical geneticist dysmorphologist sees. 
The mother notices there's something wrong with the kid, not developing normally, significant problems, and these are the microdeletions. These are the microdeletions that we see in utero. They're exactly the same. So we are seeing the pathology that is leading to kids having abnormalities, seeing clinical geneticists. Just a, a quick uh, case, and let's assume, and I'm sure there's some residents here that you've already made the diagnosis, uh, this is a child with a VSD, an overriding aorta, typical tetralogy of Fallot. If you have a surgeon like we do, he says, oh, I can fix these, no problem, I'm a really good surgeon. They all think they are. But if we look and do an amnio and find out that this is not just a tetralogy, but it has a deletion on 22Q associated with DeGeorge syndrome, not only do they have heart problems, they have multiple other problems, probably most important to the family, about two-thirds, if not more, have learning disabilities, and what we found out over the last basically decade is about one in four, by the time they're through adolescence, have severe um, uh, schizophrenia and other cognitive disorders. So who would have thought that you know, a heart defect is associated with this? But now we are able to give much better counseling to these parents that have structural anomalies. Okay. That takes care of copy number variants, and I'm sure Huda's going to go into it in much more detail. The second thing are autosomal recessive or Mendelian dis whoops, sorry. Autosomal recessive or Mendelian disorders, and these are not uncommon. In North America, it's one in every 280 births. And severe or profound, by any definition you would use, is about one in 500 births. Each of these is rare, but there are over 6,000 genetic disorders, and they affect approximately uh, combined 25 to 30 million people in the states. More importantly, Mendelian single gene disorders account for about 10 percent, one in 10 pediatric emissions, and two in 10 uh, infant mortalities, babies that die or children that die. Again, compare these numbers to trisomy 21, where we spend the bulk of our screening money at the present time. This is Gary. 